Hi, readers. Welcome to Books Connect Us from Penguin Random House. This is a podcast about staying connected with each other and the stories and authors who inspire us. Britt Bennett is the author of the New York Times bestseller, The Mothers. Her latest work is The Vanishing Half, a stunning new novel about twin sisters, inseparable as children, who ultimately choose to live in two very different worlds, one black and one white. Weaving together multiple strands and generations of this family, Britt Bennett produces a story that is at once riveting, emotional, and a brilliant exploration of the American history of passing. Let's now join Riverhead Marketing Director Ashley Sutton in conversation with author Britt Bennett. Well, this is so exciting. Britt, what a time to be alive. (laughs) (laughs) Right now. I just want to say on behalf of the Penguin Random House family that we are just so excited that you chose us so many years ago to be a part of our publishing family and to be a part of um, of your publishing journey as well. Um, and especially um, on our Riverhead team, we are so thrilled to be with you and stay with you along the journey. We love working with you and we love working for you. <laughs> so, <laughs> so let's jump right in. When you finish writing this book, would you ever have imagined in a million years um, the parallels with the current racial and social unrest in the nation right now, kind of mirroring very similar racial tones in your book? You know, to to answer your question, no. Um, I, you know, I think, um, you know, as 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 uh, as we kind of head into the spring and, and this pandemic started to unfold, I. I started to realize that that would be the context surrounding my book would be the fact that we were living through this, this generational crisis. Um, and I never thought that somehow sort of in the, the week or maybe a couple weeks leading up to the book that the conversation would have in some ways sort of shifted in that moment um, away from the pandemic briefly, I think, and towards this conversation about racial injustice um, or even that those would be uh, conversations that would be happening concurrently because they are both conversations that involve race, the fact that this pandemic has disproportionately killed black and brown people. Um, So I never imagined that there would be this external context for the book. I just had been working on this book for a while. um, And and I think I was more prepared for it coming out in an election year. I thought that that would be the context, which feels like a, like a quaint thought that I had of, oh, it's going to be months leading up to the election. I will have to talk about this book. That feels so quaint now, considering all of the other, you know, sort of crises that we have, we have all endured so far and surely are, are sort of on the way. <laughs> yep. We'll talk about that in a second. We'll talk about that in a second. All right. So, I think the theme, and this this could just be me, but I, I think the theme I'd like to go with for 2020 is resilience, right? You wrote a book, it then went on to go through the editing phase, and here we are in the midst of a pandemic. Anyone else would have probably had a panic attack and said, you know what, it is what it is. But you seem to really be rolling with the flow. Can you just talk a little bit about how you've learned to become more adaptable during this time? Yeah, I mean, I think to be very, uh, you know, to be fair, um, and I, I, yeah, I feel like I've been so fortunate during this pandemic that I have uh, been able to work from home. I'm used to working from home, um, so I didn't have to go through the adjustment that I'm sure Um, A lot of you guys who are used to being in the office have had to adjust. I don't have children that I'm also trying to educate at the same time, not a central worker. Um, So I feel like I've I've been really fortunate um, in this situation to be able to to roll with the punches a bit. Um, But I think beyond that, one of the big, uh, I guess, revelations for me about this experience of the pandemic is just how much we are all capable of adjusting to. I, I... I think I previously thought of myself as a sort of an inflexible person in certain ways. I thought of myself very much as a creature of habit. And I think that that's still true, but you know, to see the ways in which uh, all of our lives changed so dramatically um, in March and April and the ways in which they have still continued to change 
Um, you know, I think that that's something that I have learned about myself, that I am capable of adapting to more than I expected, that I am capable of accepting that things are out of my control, um, that the idea that things were ever in my control has always been an illusion. <laughs> um, having to kind of face that reality, I think, has been important for me uh, in this moment. Um, and hopefully, once we are out of this moment, will be something that I will carry with me as life continues to change. Yeah, I like that. I, I wholeheartedly agree. You know, listen, we work in an industry where, you know, we come to work, we open those doors, we sit down at our desks, and it's, it's physical, right? And none of us thought in a, <laughs> a million years, we would be publishing these incredible books from our bedrooms. Um, and, I, and I agree with you. I think it's all about us kind of taking that and, and layering it in to our future lives. Because, you know, life is not about just being stuck in a box. It's about outside the box. Um, all right, cool. Okay, so you mentioned in the past, and I've, I've watched and read many of your interviews, um, <laughs> that I'm kind of a stalker, everyone. Um, but <laughs> some of your beloved literary goddesses like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and so many more have really helped to shape your writing. Could you share with us how you came about reading either of those women and the impact that it made on you as a young reader and as a Black woman? Yeah, I mean, I think most of those are reader or writers that I just like their books that I stole from my, my parents family bookshelf. Um, you know, I remember, I think that's how I came. I remember the Toni Morrison book that my parents had was The Bluest Eye. Um, and I read that uh, when I was probably too young, but I read it anyway. Um, and I remember they had the color purple, um, you know, on the just on the shelf. Um, so there were books like that that I just that I just encountered because my parents had them on the shelf and they were always books that I read to kind of supplement my education because we were not reading black women in school. Um, so we weren't we weren't really reading black people at all. Like I don't quite remember. I don't even think we read Beloved when I was in high school. Um, so most of these books were books that I just encountered on my own and, and uh, took from my parents and read. Um, but I think, you know, they were really important for me. I think I have been sort of recently reflecting on um, a lot of these this sort of moment and I think in the 90s when I was a kid and, and seeing uh, people like Toni Morrison or Alice Walker or Terry McMillan, seeing these Black women writers uh, earn critical acclaim but also sell tons and tons of books and also be on Oprah and also be on, you know, and and the news and those types of images, I think, were always uh, just really cool to me to see these black women living writers. Um, because I think I also, when you're in school, you just think of writers as like dead people. You know, you're not thinking of them as like I'm pro probably. I assume um, you know people don't like kids in school don't feel that way now because you can see writers on Instagram. But you know, back in my day, um, oh, <laughs> that. <laughs> Back in my time, uh, no, I, that was just not anything I ever thought about was, was writers as like living people until you saw somebody on Oprah, you saw someone in the, you know, so I think of those black women writers who really, I think, paved the way in a lot of ways of, of writing work that was really, uh, you know, that centered the experiences of black women, but also proving that those books could sell and that they could be, uh, that they could resonate with people who were not black women. They could, they could resonate to the mass audience. I think of those writers as being uh, really important in, in my life as a reader and eventually as a writer. Yeah, I love that. I really wish you were wearing your decolonize your bookshelves t shirt <laughs> because that speaks to it so much, right? It's all about the experiences that we have and you know if you don't know you don't know and i think that it's important for us all to really diversify um the ways in which we look and think about the world um okay so everyone needs a support system and i can only imagine what type of support as a young writer um like yourself you've needed over the years um you've had some really early supporters early on even from the likes of our very own jackie woodson um before she even signed on to to riverhead you know how how did you know how to reach out or did authors just come and offer that support to you 
Um, honestly, I just got very lucky. Um, so Jackie, I was sitting next to her on a panel and I think it was probably the first or one of the first panels I'd ever done. We were in some ballroom in like Orlando. Um, and I just was next to her on a panel and I think she very clearly noticed that I was nervous because I was, um, and she just started talking to me. And I remember she asked me towards the end, like, oh, can you sign, can you sign a, your book for my daughter? Um, and I don't even know if anyone had ever asked me to sign a book before, you know? So that was like a thing that I did. And I was like, oh, that's so cool. She asked me to sign this book and I gave her the book. And, and then I just went about, you know, wandering around this ballroom in Orlando by myself. Um, and I didn't think anything of it. I didn't, I didn't think that she would read the book or that, that she would reach out in the way that she has. Um, so that was something that I felt very, very fortunate to just sort of be seated, seated next to on a panel. Um, and I think of somebody like Angela Flournoy, who's now one of my good friends. And she was somebody that I think we be, kind of became friends on Twitter. Um, and I was a, a grad student at Michigan at the time, and she was reading in um, Ann Arbor, and we just went to lunch. And um, she, you know, so has supported my books and become a friend and become someone that I, that I lean on to and I ask for advice. And I, and I hit up with questions and hit up to gripe and all those things. So a lot of these are, are writers that I've just been really fortunate to, to cross paths with. Um, and I, I felt, um, you know, I don't, I mean, I'm, I honestly don't have any stories of, of any writers that have been nightmares to me. Everybody has been so wonderful and sweet and kind. <laughs> um, I don't even have like a fun story about somebody being awful. I feel like I've been, I've been really fortunate. All the writers that I've really encountered in my career so far have been amazing. Good, good, good. Okay, so, you know, earlier we said we were going to come back to the presidential <laughs> election. <laughs> so speaking of support, a little birdie told me that the one and only Ann Patchett offered <laughs> you safe harbor while you were on tour for the mothers right after our current president was elected. Would you please share this story with us? <laughs> um, yeah, I, I was... You know, I was on a plane during the election night, so I landed and I'm just trying to catch up with what had happened. And it was a very traumatic experience, particularly just being, you know, I was in, I think, Massachusetts or somewhere. I didn't know anybody wherever I was. Um, and uh, she reached out and asked if I wanted to stay at her house because she was worried about me being by myself at that, like in the wake of this traumatic political event. Um, and at first I, I almost said no, I just felt way too intimidated. Like, what am I supposed to like do in Ann Patchett's house? <laughs> um, <laughs> but I was glad I said yes. I mean, she's, um, you know, so cool. I just cannot get over the fact that she did it. She, um, we went to her mom's house. Her mom was going somewhere. So we went to her mom's house to walk her mom's dogs. Um, and, you know, she took me to lunch. Like, she was so kind. She made me breakfast the morning I left. And we, like, just talked to her kitchen. Um, and, and then she, like, sent, like, a bunch of her books, just signed copies of her books to my mom afterwards. And, like, a really sweet note. And she was just so kind. So I, like, I tweeted this story out because somebody asked for, you know, times that writers had been generous to you for no reason. And I hadn't really told, I told the story to my friends, but I hadn't really said anything uh, beyond that. But I was like, no, this is like a, actually a really kind thing that someone who did not know me did for me. Um, and it actually made its way back to her. Um, and she sent me a really sweet email and was, we were reflecting on that, <clears throat> excuse me, on that, that time that we had and how it was like a really nice moment that kind of salvaged some of that sort of post um, election <laughs> grief that, that we were both feeling. Um, but, but yeah, that's just, I think an example of way that I've been really fortunate as a writer to just stumble upon people who have been so kind and generous to me and who've really taken me under their wing in certain ways. Yeah, yeah, that's beautiful. Um, so you had fans from the very beginning with the indies for the mothers, you know, BEA Buzz Book, number one indie next pick, and the list goes on. Our Riverhead team has seen you as big from the beginning, um, and it's no surprise that The Vanishing Half was highly anticipated. How did you decide you wanted to grow as a writer coming off of the mothers and into The Vanishing Half? <clears throat> Yeah, I mean, I just think as a writer, I always want to do something that I didn't do before. I want to learn how to do something new. Uh, I want to challenge myself in some way. Um, so I knew that I didn't want to write The Mother's Part Two. I knew that I wanted to write something that was going to feel different. Um, and when I started thinking about this book, it felt different. It felt 
bigger. It felt a little bit more epic. It felt a little bit more expansive. Um, the Mothers is, you know, a pretty linear coming of age story. And this book was going to be kind of non-linear and it was going to be multi-generational and it was going to take place in these different times and places. And there's sort of a little bit of, you know, jumping from location to location. All of those were different things. Um, so I think that is just something I'm seeking as I'm always seeking a challenge and, and trying to learn how to do something that I didn't know how to do before. Um, and I think that was, that was the, I think the biggest thing motivating me, um, in writing the vanishing half was, yeah, I just want to, I want to try something different. I want to, I want to learn something different. Yeah. Yeah. That's life's goal, right? Um, okay. So speaking of Riverhead, you know, our team at Riverhead, we, we truly believe that we publish authors and not books. Um, you'll hear Jess say that all the time. Because of that grounding principle, you know, we look at each book differently. Um, the success of one book isn't a free ride for the next book. Um, so tell me, did you have concerns about the sophomore slump, especially with such an ambitious book like this? Uh, <laughs> I mean, I don't know. I, I, I feel like I was definitely, I definitely, uh, felt very stressed at moments writing this book. I don't know if it was so much uh, fear of a sophomore slump as just, you know, fear that this book wasn't coming together and that, I mean, I guess, I guess that is, you know, like fear that the book isn't coming together and you're going to disappoint people who, who liked mm -hmm. your first book. I guess that is sort of a sophomore slump. Um, so I, I think I was worried about that. I think really what helped me was just talking to friends and I had a friend who at one point was just like, look, you've never written a second novel before. Um, and I think I was really hard on myself because I'm like, I've done this before. This is not my first book, um, which is true, but I had never written a second book. And just like now I've never written a third book, you know? So I think having to come to terms with the fact that that is the process, that each book requires something differently of you, um, that each book asks something differently of you um, and accepting that, I think that that was an important thing that I had to learn uh, in the process of working on this book. But mostly I just tried to, just sort of block out any external praise and any external criticism. I just, I try not to get too high and I try not to get too low. And I feel like blocking <laughs> all of that out and just creating towards the goal of wanting to write something that feels good to me, that feels alive, that feels like it brings me joy, uh, trying to write towards that instead of trying to write towards what people loved about the mothers or what they are writing away from what they hated about the mothers. Um, I just had to sort of try to block myself off from all of that and just focus on on the page and, and what excited me about the page. Well, I'm very glad that you, you <laughs> pushed through because here we are. Um, <laughs> you know, and you are incredibly talented, you're highly accomplished and yet so humble. And I, you know, do you feel changed in any way, good, bad, <laughs> and, you know, in any way by this latest success? You've got an HBO multi-million dollar deal. You, multiple weeks on the New York Times, starting off at number one. I mean, what, how do you feel? <laughs> I mean, it feels great. Um, I don't, I don't know if I feel changed. I think that there are things that have tangibly changed in my life, you know, like the HBO series that we've already started kind of, you know, hitting the ground running with that and, and those conversations. Um, there are those sorts of ways I think in which my life um, is different and, and, you know, all the virtual events and things that people are asking me to do that they hadn't been asking me to do before. Um, there are those moments. Um, but, you know, like I said, at the end of the day, I just think, I think that, I don't know, I don't mean this to sound like, um, you know, I'm somebody who has figured all of these things out. <laughs> but I just think that a realization that I had also with the mothers was, again, this feeling of, you know, the, all the external things are great. Like the, the acclaim is great, awards, all of those things, they change your life in real intangible ways. Um, and I don't mean to diminish any of that, but at the end of the day, that like what truly brings me joy is, is writing a good sentence. You know, <laughs> that is the thing that truly brings me joy. So, um, so I, I try not to put too much stock on any of the outside stuff as much as I enjoy it, I appreciate it, I'm proud of it. Um, I just, I realize I cannot base my happiness in that. Um, and I think particularly during this pandemic, I think a lot of us are realizing that a lot of the things that we 
sort of we're leaning on for, for our self-worth and for our happiness and that those are not really the things that matter to you that much um, or those things can be taken away in an instant. And then what are you left with? You're just left with yourself. Um, so I think that a lot of us have had to have those kind of uh, realizations in this moment of what you really value and, and, and what you take pride in and, and what contributes to your, to your sense of self. So I try not to put too much stock in the outside stuff. I, I try to um, enjoy it, celebrate it. I had uh, lots of solo champagne while I've been quarantining by myself. Um, I've never drank champagne alone before in my life, I think, except in this pandemic. Um, but it's also, it felt like a, a metaphor for, for the situation that I was having. I felt so fortunate to be experiencing um, so much good fortune at a time of deep suffering for most people. Um, but at the same time, you are experiencing it completely alone because of the nature of this pandemic. So, yeah. Well, I love that answer. And it's true. You know, I think we all have looked around and, and, and found that another handbag and an, another yeah. pair of shoes is really not what's going to fill that cup up. And, you know, we are so grateful for all of the energy and time that you're putting into doing all of these interviews and all of that. But but we want you to get back to writing those sentences <laughs> so that we can get another book. Um, okay, so, you know, when you and I first met, you'd shared with us such a cool story from your mom, um, which inspired The Vanishing Half. Would you mind sharing that story with the rest of us? Yeah, um, yeah, so I, I don't actually remember the context of this conversation, but she just re mentioned to me one day over the phone and. I don't know, 2015, I think it was, um, that she just mentioned this town that she had heard about um, in Louisiana that was filled with, with light-skinned Black people who sort of intermarried within their community in order that their children would get lighter from generation to generation. Um, and it was a thing that she told me very offhandedly as if it were sort of something that everybody just kind of knew. Um, and it really, to me, was the spark of a novel. It gave me... Uh, the idea of a setting, it introduced a problem, it introduced a setting, um, it hinted at the people who might be living there. Um, and I immediately thought about someone who um, is from that place and leaves and someone who returns to that place. And that's kind of what gave me the twins. I love that. Um, okay, so in both books, The Mothers and The Vanishing Half, motherhood plays a strong role. And in The Vanishing Half in particular, daughters are also a centerpiece of the story. Could you elaborate on, you know, your focus around relationships between mothers and daughters and what impact of intergenerational narratives that have? Yeah, I think I'm always just interested in those types of stories. I'm interested in mothers and daughters and I'm interested in sisters. Uh, because I think the mothers, it's obviously a book about mothers and daughters, but it's also a book about sort of this chosen sisterhood between Nadia and Aubrey. Um, so I think I'm always kind of driven to those relationships. I mean, I think part of it is I grew up in a very heavily female household. It was just my dad and, and then my two sisters, my mom and myself. Um, so I always grew up in this house that was that was filled with women. Um, and I think that that's a, a space in which I have always felt very comfortable <laughs> um, of these sort of female heavy spaces. Um, so I think that, that that's part of, I think, why I'm interested. Um, but I also just love the idea of generations and people from different generations inheriting things from each other, whether those are secrets, trauma, or, or uh, memories, or whatever that you're inheriting. Um, the idea of people from genera different generations talking to or talking past each other, as we often do. Um, there's just something very complex about these, I don't know, these different sort of generations of women that I always find myself drawn to. I love that. Um, so the subject of passing is a major theme, obviously, in the book, as you just spoke about. Do you feel that code switching is a form of passing in you know, that Black writers do or have done in order to be seen in the publishing industry? That's an interesting question. Um, I mean, I don't know, because I think that um, in my sort of research about passing, what I, what I found to be quite interesting was, you know, there are people who pass in the way that Stella passes in the book, where she completely steps out of this, this Black world and completely steps into this white world, and the door slams shut. Um, and then there are also people who pass from time to time. There are people who pass because they want a new job or there are people who pass because 
Um, they want to be paid more or you're passing while you're on the train because you want to sit in the nice part of the train. And then when you get off the train, you're black again. Um, and I think that that is maybe more akin to sort of the code switching that, that you're talking about. The idea of passing as something that can be temporary, um, something that can be sort of leveraged. Um, the idea of sort of leveraging uh, what you can within a system that is already um, unfair and unequal, but leveraging it to your advantage. Um, and I think that that is something that, um, you know, a lot of people did and do, still do. Um, and, and that maybe connects more to it in, in that sort of way. Um, so I don't know, it, it's tough because I think, you know, code switching um, is a survival strategy in some ways. There are other ways in which I find it really fun and artful. Um, there are other ways um, in which it feels uh, sort of oppressive that it's necessary. Um, but there are also times in which it's deeply funny and in which, um, you know, I, I've had moments like my, my mom would be like, I don't do that. And I would just like, in that sentence, you just code switched in this way. Um, and it's become so sort of intuitive that you're not realizing that you're even doing it. Um, you know, like you hear your, like when you hear your parent on the phone and you're just like, who is that talking on the phone? Yeah. You know? Um, so, you know, I think it's, it's, it's complex in that way, but I think that, you know, I, I, I love language and all of its different forms. I find language so interesting and the ways in which we deploy it and change it and, um, the ways in which it can be something that, uh, can feel oppressive and the ways in which it can be something that feels very transgressive and something that feels um, sort of bold and audacious and, and, and funny. So I, I find it interesting in those ways, but I do think that to your question, I think there is sort of an element of, of passing in it um, and that sort of moment to moment passing maybe. Yeah. Okay, nice. Um, okay, so there are some nods to MLK segregation and more in the novel. How did you think about history as you were writing this book? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I thought about history mostly as kind of a backdrop for, for what these characters were actually experiencing. Um, you know, I don't consider myself a historian at all. Um, I am interested in history, but I'm not, uh, you know, people who, who write these very deeply, deeply researched historical novels where every single detail is, you know, I, I'm not interested in that, to be honest. Um, I'm not... I'm not interested in finding out the make and model of the radio that they were listening, you know, like, I don't care that much. Um, that's just not, that's not my ministry. Um, but, um, but I am interested in the idea of, of history as backdrop and these characters who are living through these big historical moments, like the assassination of Dr. King, but at the same time, they are also experiencing their own private crises and their own emotional problems. Um, and I think, again, that's something that we can all relate to right now that, you know, we're living through this generational crisis of this pandemic and people are going through breakups and people are, you know, changing jobs and people are moving and, you know, these small things like that. Um, my mom moved to D.C. the week that Dr. King was assassinated. She was like fresh out of her town in Louisiana, had never been anywhere, was like 19 years old or something. Um, and suddenly was in the middle of this huge, you know, protest and uprising that, that was coming out of this moment. And when I asked her about it, she's like, yeah, you know, we were shopping for furniture for the new apartment. And like, those are the sort of, you know, pedestrian concerns on your mind because you need to find, you know, a couch for your apartment. And then you stumble into history, you know, so... <laughs> Yeah, so I, I find that I find that to be the way that I'm most interested, I think, in writing about history. I love that. Um, okay, so I've seen, I've watched so many of your interviews and, you know, your Instagram posts, of course, and you are clearly a literary, like an engaged literary citizen. Um, we'd love to know, is there anything that you're reading and loving at the moment? I know you're a super fan of Luster by Raven Leilani. Is there anything else that you're loving or is like you would recommend as a go-to? Yeah, I mean, a lot of, I guess, things I would recommend as a go-to. Um, I mean, I just finished uh, Rodham, uh, the, the Hillary Clinton book, um, which mm -hmm. was, I'm like interested in these books that are fiction about real people, these kind of fictionalized. Um, I, I recently read the, um, the Joyce Carol Oates book, Blonde, which is like a fictionalized biography of Marilyn Monroe, who is not a historical figure I've ever found remotely interesting until I read this book. And I was like, oh, this is a really fascinating life. Hmm. 
Um, so, um, so those were two interesting books in very different ways. Um, um, uh, right now I'm rereading Song of Solomon, uh, which is just a favorite book that I've just been really enjoying revisiting. I think rereading is really important part of, of just reading because <laughs> once you know what the plot is, then you can enjoy the book, I think, differently. Um, so I've enjoyed that book. Um, I think uh, the, the Prettiest Star um, is a book that I really loved, um, which is about this young man who, um, who is dying of AIDS and he returns to his uh, family in Ohio um, to essentially die and he's been estranged from them. So it's really, really heartbreaking, um, really beautiful. Um, and then a bunch of the books um, conveniently behind me, which are a lot of my friends' books. Um, so The Gimmicks by Chris McCormick, um, which is about the Armenian ge genocide and, uh, and, and professional wrestling. Um, it's a really fascinating, epic, sort of globe-trotting story about justice and performance and masculinity and, and all these sorts of things. So that's, that's a book that I recommend. Um, and I also, I, I mean, I also love recommending Ann Patchett anything um, as we talked about her before. The Bel Canto's probably the book that I've recommended to most people that everyone has loved. Um, so I love, I love recommending her work. I think I've never recommended a book by her that someone has not liked. Nice. All right. I, we are almost out of time, but I have a couple more questions. So yeah. um, as an author, you know, what is one systemic change you'd like to see in the publishing industry? I know that's a tall order, but anything <laughs> <laughs> yeah i mean it is it's tough um you know i think uh my sort of first reaction is just like yeah you want to see uh people of color who have decision making power who have like real decision making power um you know i think uh it's it's i feel like in publishing as in many industries um, you know, you'll see a lots of people of color sort of at entry level positions. And then as you get steadily higher and higher up the chain, it gets wider and it gets mailer. Um, and, and, and that's something that I, that I always find disconcerting. Um, so I think, I think that is something that is big. I think I've been glad to see people start to recognize, oh, we should, you know, have events with uh, these black owned bookstores. Like people have felt like people sort of suddenly awakened to the possibility of doing that in June. Um, that these would be, you know, good like good co communities to partner with and and uh, and places to send writers. So I think that that's something that I hope to that people continue that energy. And it's not just this, you know, like like the like the banana bread phase of quarantine or when everyone was making sourdough. <laughs> like I don't want it to be this type of you know momentary thing. And then two or three years from now, nobody is sending their writers to black bookstores anymore. You know, so. I think that's a great thing. I just think acknowledging, yeah, the different types of readers and the different ways that you can that you can meet readers. Um, you know, this I did that event with, with Dr. Kendi and the NBA and the WNBA, and I thought that was such a cool idea of of bringing in, um, you know, maybe people who would not go to a, a bookstore reading or something like that, but who love basketball or who love you know whatever else. Uh, yeah. The idea of finding readers in all the places that they can be and, and not just assuming the, the sort of hypothetical reader to fit to some, you know, predetermined demographic. Um, so I think all of those things, I just hope, uh, you know, I think uh, I've been encouraged by um, what a lot of people inside the publishing industry have said. Um, but I think that that's the question is whether that sort of fervor that people had in, in June is something that continues on and continues to change real things um, yeah. as, as we sort of move away from that, that cultural conversation. I love that. Do you have a favorite experience with a reader that you want to share? You know, how did that moment come about and, and why or how did it stick with you? That's a good question. I've had, I mean, I've had so many, um, you know, interesting experiences. I had, you know, when I was in Australia, there was like an artist who brought this like sculpture he had done based on the cover of The Mothers and he just like presented to me um, as I was signing the book and I just wow. was so completely thrown um, that he had done that. Um, you know, I think now there's so many people reaching out to you online. Um, I did a, a, a Zoom book club event where there was someone shared their screen and presented to me their casting suggestions for the miniseries, <laughs> just the best use of 
screen sharing on Zoom that anyone had ever done. So that was really funny and cute. Um, so there are moments like that, I think. But I, just, I think I, I, I appreciate, um, you know, hearing from people online, but I do miss the sort of face-to-face -face interactions you get in bookstores and traveling to different countries and meeting readers there, going to dinner with booksellers, uh, talking to people about their communities. I do miss all of that a lot, but I feel very fortunate. I've, I've had um, a lot of really kind readers just reach out to me with enthusiasm about this book. Well, I think we are done with all of our questions. And I just wanted to, again, say thank you, thank you, thank you from the bottom of our hearts, Britt, for A, taking the time to come and chat with us, chat with me. Um, and then, and B, of course, just for signing on to Riverhead and PRH. We love you, we adore you, and we cannot wait to see more from you this fall. <laughs> and of course, next year, you know, we got to keep those numbers going. But thank you so much, Britt. <laughs> thank you. Thanks for having me. Bye. Thank you. Bye. And now, here's an exclusive excerpt from the audiobook, courtesy of Penguin Random House Audio. It was a strange town. Mallard, named after the ring-necked ducks living in the rice fields and marshes. A town that, like any other, was more idea than place. The idea arrived to Alphonse de Cure in 1848, as he stood in the sugarcane fields, he'd inherited from the father who'd once owned him. The father now dead, the now freed son wished to build something on those acres of land that would last for centuries to come. A town for men like him, who would never be accepted as white, but refused to be treated like Negroes. A third place. His mother, rest her soul, had hated his lightness. When he was a boy, she'd shoved him under the sun, begging him to darken. Maybe that's what made him first dream of the town. Lightness, like anything inherited at great cost, was a lonely gift. He'd married a mulatto even lighter than himself. She was pregnant then with their first child, and he imagined his children's children's children, lighter still, like a cup of coffee steadily diluted with cream, a more perfect Negro, each generation lighter than the one before. Soon others came, soon idea and place became inseparable, and Mallard carried throughout the rest of St. Landry Parish. Colored people whispered about it, wondered about it. White people couldn't believe it even existed. When St. Catherine's was built in 1938, the diocese sent over a young priest from Dublin who arrived certain that he was lost. Didn't the bishop tell him that Mallard was a colored town? Well, who were these people walking about, fair and blonde and redheaded, the darkest ones no swarthier than a Greek? Was this who counted for colored in America, who whites wanted to keep separate? Well, how could they ever tell the difference? By the time the Veins twins were born, Alphonse de Cure was dead, long gone. But his great-great-great-granddaughters inherited his legacy, whether they wanted to or not. Even Desiree, who complained before every Founder's Day picnic, who rolled her eyes when the Founder was mentioned in school, as if none of that business had anything to do with her. This would stick after the twins disappeared. How Desiree never wanted to be a part of the town that was her birthright. How she felt that you could flick away history like shrugging a hand off your shoulder. You can escape a town, but you cannot escape blood. Somehow, the Veen's twins believed themselves capable of both. And yet, if Alphonse de Cure could have strolled through the town he'd once imagined, he would have been thrilled by the sight of his great-great-great-granddaughters. Twin girls, creamy skin, hazel eyes, wavy hair. He would have marveled at them. For the child to be a little more perfect than the parents, what could be more wonderful than that? The Veen's twins vanished on August 14th, 
1954, right after the Founders' Day dance, which everyone realized later had been their plan all along. Stella, the clever one, would have predicted that the town would be distracted. Sun drunk from the long barbecue in the town square, where Willie Lee, the butcher, smoked racks of ribs and brisket and hot links. Then the speech by Mayor Fontenot, Father Cavanaugh blessing the food, the children already fidgety, picking flecks of crispy chicken skin from plates held by praying parents. A long afternoon of celebration while the band played, the night ending in a dance in the school gymnasium, where the grown folks stumbled home after too many cups of Trinity Thierry's rum punch, the few hours back in that gym pulling them tenderly toward their younger selves. Thank you for listening to Books Connect Us. For more great book recommendations and information about your favorite authors, feel free to follow Penguin Random House on social media or visit penguinrandomhouse.com. And if you've enjoyed what you've heard, go ahead and leave us a review on Apple Podcasts as it helps more listeners to find our show. This podcast is produced by Pat Stango and edited by Clayton Gumbert. I've been Aaron Leaf, and until next time, this has been Books Connect Us. Thank you.